to my knowledge, most cancer types are associated with obesity. Not every cancer, of course, but at least the the major um, cancers that afflict our Western civilization, like breast, rectal cancer, um, prostate cancer, um, pancreatic cancer, uh, so, so, uh, gynecological cancers. So obesity has certainly a, a large impact. Okay, good morning, everyone. I uh, hope everybody's doing today. Today we have our guest, Rainier Clement, Dr. Clement. Good morning, or sorry, good evening, I guess, for you. <laughs> good evening. <laughs> How are you today? Good to see you. I'm great, thanks. How are you? I am doing well, thank you. I, I had a ribeye steak and six eggs, so I'm ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> You're joining us from, is it Switzerland, is that correct? No, it's Germany. Oh, Germany, never mind. Okay, for some reason I was thinking of Switzerland. Anyway, well, well welcome. And guten tag, I guess is what I should say. Then uh, I was uh, I was actually born in Germany, in Hof in Bavaria. Uh, I spent a year really? there. Oh, okay. Really. I'm also in Bavaria. Okay, very nice, very nice. So you've got a quite interesting background, and I was I was I was looking through. Uh, you know, you've got a lot of papers you've published. One, one in astronomy, which I thought was was quite interesting. Uh, that, that you had maybe an astronomy paper, which was a little unusual in my, in my thought. But can you can you just for those that aren't familiar, can you just provide your background for us? Sure. So um, my name is Rainer Clement. Just as you introduced me, um, I am basically a medical physicist. So. I did my, my studies in physics, I obtained a diploma degree in physics, and then um, this was environmental physics, and then I switched to astronomy, where I did my uh, PhD for three years. Uh, so I became a PhD in astronomy, and um, then after that, I worked for another two years in the field of astronomy for a satellite project. And during that time, I did some advanced uh, courses in medical physics. So medical physics is basically, um, yeah, applied physics or physics applied to to the medical field, uh, in particular um, fields like um, radiology and uh, radiation oncology. And after this course, I decided to um, switch to medical physics because I thought. Um, from a long-term perspective, chances for a permanent uh, position are much greater than if you're a postdoc in uh, in science. So um, I took the chance to um, yeah to do with my practical um, um, study in a hospital. And this was already very close to my hometown. Uh, it was the University of Würzburg. And at this time, I was already very interested in, in diet, especially uh, the ketogenic diet and paleolithic diets because of some own health issues that I had. And because uh, I used to do a lot of sports, um, mainly triathlon as a student. And I was always interested in how I can um, enhance my performance, of course. So um, when I switched to the hospital in, in Würzburg, I got to know Ulrike Kamera. She is a professor there, and she is one of the pioneers of ketogenic diet research with respect to cancer in Germany. And uh, we hooked up together and we wrote the very first review paper on that subject, so ketogenic diet in cancer. Uh, we did the first review, which was published in Nutrition and Metabolism in 2011. And back then, the field was quite small. Um, and this paper gained a lot of attention um, internationally. It was uh, a very high-sided, it still is a very high-sided paper. And um, so I, I became very interested in tumor metabolism and how it may be influenced by diet and other lifestyle choices um, besides my uh, work in clinical routine. And after two years, uh, I was uh, fully employed as a medical physicist, and I became the chance to switch to my to the hospital in my hometown, um, which is Schweinfurt in northern Bavaria. So I moved back, basically to my home, um, and uh, this was in 2011. And since then, I worked there as a medical physicist. Mainly, I'm responsible for routine work, but uh, luckily I have the chance to do research 
um, part-time. And of course, I spend a lot of my free time for doing research. Uh, the good thing is that um, I'm fully employed by the hospital and I'm not dependent on any uh, grants or funds. So I'm very um, free in my research topics. So I can do what interests me really. That's, that's great. That's a wonderful introduction. I just, this is a sort of, uh, when I was doing my, I thought about going into radiology and I know I ended up going to orthopedic surgery, but I know that a big part of you had to do a significant amount of physics to, to go into radiology. So there's a lot, obviously a lot of physics involved in the, in, in how that works. Um, just one comment on astronomy. I'm still, I'm still uh, a little upset that you guys took away Pluto as a planet. I'm, I, you know, I thought that was a, yeah, me too. <laughs> well, <laughs> was, yeah. <laughs> anyway, I want to, you know, and, and then, you know, I'm looking at the paper that this is a 2015 paper ketogenic diets consumed during radio chemotherapy have beneficial effects on quality of life and metabolic health in patients with rectal cancer. Uh, I may I assume maybe that was a, the paper you were talking about that got, that got a lot of attention or was it? A oh, no, no, no. That was much later. This, book, okay. this is basically, uh, we published this, I think, last year. The paper I, I talked about was published in 2011. So it's already uh, yeah, 11 years ago. Um, and it was the very first, it was a review paper. So we simply reviewed all the evidence uh, that was out there for um, carbohydrate restriction and ketogenic diets being beneficial in cancer treatment and prevention. You may be familiar with the work of a guy named Thomas Seyfried, who's, I think he's out yeah, of course. Boston University. Yeah, and so, because he, he is a big proponent of uh, what he calls a mito mitochondrial metabolic problem that, that tumor genesis or, or cancer is. What are your thoughts around, well, I guess, what does nutrition do to uh, tumor cells and, and cancer cells? How do we, how, do, how does that interact right now? That you, What's your understanding these days? Um, there, th basically, it's it's a very complex problem. So uh, nutrition is not straightforward, like uh, taking a drug which has one or two uh, meta um, molecular targets. It's uh, very uh, complex, and I think there are basically two main um, mechanisms how nutrition affects cancer growth. One is via um, inflammation. The other is via growth factors. And of course, when, when we think about cancer, um, the major growth factors for tumor cells are glucose, insulin, insulin-like growth factor. Um, most tumor cells will speed up their replication when they are exposed to those factors. So it's, an, it's a natural thought uh, or a natural idea to think about restricting glucose in the diet to limit those growth factors. I mean, glucose is the major stimulant of insulin. And... We, all, we also know that most uh, cancers are associated with metabolic syndrome or metabolic derangements. Um, so it's a natural um, idea to, to restrict uh, glucose and maybe also carbohydrates in general because they are broken up to glucose in the body. The other route is, uh, that I mentioned is inflammation. And here also uh, we can think about the chronic uh, diseases of civilization, which um, basically enhance uh, inflammation in the body. Um, and tumor growth always is associated with inflammation. Inflammation itself is a potent stimulant for tumor growth. So whenever there are some uh, malignant cells or pre-malignant cells in the body, usually the immune system will take care of them. But if there is uh, chronic inflammation in the body, chances that these cells will survive and proliferate and maybe form a small tumor are much higher. So uh, limiting inflammation is also a good idea. And this can also be done uh, with a proper diet. I think about uh, omega-3 fatty acids, limiting glucose, which is pro-inflammatory pro and uh, reducing uh, um, abundant body fat, which is also a very uh, potent inflammatory stimulant. How does how does inflammation promote growth for these cells, or does, or does it just prevent? I think I think you mentioned prevent surveillance. It kind of limits our our, our ability to take out the cells. Is that what, it, what it's doing? It does that, but also it, it directly uh, enhances tumor growth. For example, by stimulating um, the proliferation of um, mitochondria within cells. Um, but these mitochondria, when they are stimulated to, to, um, to 
proliferate at a, at a very fast rate uh, via inflammation, they become dysfunctional. Uh, with dysfunctional, I mean metabolically dysfunctional. So that means um, the, um, they produce more reactive oxygen species, for example, and they are less efficient in producing ATP, which is essential for the cell to survive. And if there is too, uh, if the mitochondria no longer produce uh, enough ATP, the only chance that the cell has as a whole to survive will be to upregulate its alternative pathways of ATP generation, which uh, in the cytosol is uh, via um, substrate level fermentation, that is uh, glucose breakdown, pyruvate, and then to lactate. This is basically one of the hallmarks of cancer that Otto Warburg in the 1920s already uh, discovered and described in great detail that cancer cells will take up large amounts of glucose and excrete large amounts of lactate in exchange, um, even if there is uh, sufficient oxygen in the microenvironment. So this is also called aerobic glycolysis. And it's basically really a hallmark of of every uh, malignant or very aggressive cancer. Uh, for example, in radiation oncology, we use um, positron emission tomography with a glucose tracer, which is called FDG, uh, fluor deoxyglucose. And um, this is a glucose analog that gets injected into patients and accumulates within tissues uh, that take up a lot of glucose compared to the uh, other tissues. And tumors uh, basically fall under this category. They take up a lot of glucose. And uh, in this case, the uh, glucose is radioactively labeled. So it gets trapped in the cells, can no longer be metabolized um, fully, uh, but then decays. And um, it's, it's a better decay. So there's a positron emitted. And this can be detected. So, detected, so we can uh, visualize the spots within the body that have a, a high uptake of glucose. That's basically how, how um, positron emission tomography functions. Um, and, and we use, we utilize this uh, technology to, um, yeah, to, to visualize areas of tumors that are, are very aggressive or highly proliferative. And this will be treated with uh, extra high doses in radiation oncology, for example. What is the, you know, what, it, as of 2022, what is the state of our knowledge with regard to human data uh, with diet and cancer treatment? I know there's there's some animal studies, there's some you know case mm -hmm. reports. Are we getting closer to seeing you know some more uh, solid evidence? The critics will say there's no good quality, high quality human evidence. Are we are we any closer to that yet? <clears throat> uh, the critics are they are not uh, completely right. I would think, but they certainly have uh, some justification to say that, because we still lack uh, very high quality clinical data. Uh, this is true to a certain extent. However, uh, the amount of clinical studies that we have now compared to 10 years ago is much, much higher. So there are very uh, much, uh, there are um, a lot of um, clinical studies right now being done. However, they mostly consist of few participants, uh, between 10 and uh, let's say 30 participants in a ketogenic diet group. Um, an example is our own study that we uh, published in, in five or six papers now. We, we took uh, three groups of tumor patients, um, breast cancer patients, rectal cancer patients, and patients with head and neck cancer. And um, in total, I think we had 70 or so patients who did a ketogenic diet during radiotherapy. So ketogenic diet combined with radiation treatment and compared them with a control group who, who was on a standard diet and also underwent radiation treatment. Um, we were able to show that um, the combination of ketogenic diet and radiotherapy had a, had a beneficial, a very significant beneficial effect on body composition. And we also found some hints in the rectal cancer patients that it led to a better response of the tumor to radiochemotherapy. Uh, this is consistent with animal data, by the way. Uh, the animal studies are much better powered and they are much more conclusive. So I would say there's strong evidence that a ketogenic diet um, combined with other therapies, 
in particular oxidative therapies like radiation treatment, chemotherapy, hyperbaric oxygen um, is synergistic. That means it uh, is not only additive to the uh, standard treatment, but it it um, yeah it enhances the effects uh, way beyond what would be expected by a usual diet. Um, this is in animal studies, it's uh, quite clear, but the human data are not so conclusive. But we have very uh, we have many hints that go in the same direction. At least I can say for certain that there's no hint that a ketogenic diet is detrimental to the cancer patient in any way, uh, except maybe uh, if uh, a patient is very frail concerning his body or her body composition, and he or she is not doing the diet right. For example, eating too too few calories. Um, or, yeah, I also think a ketogenic diet is not suited for everyone. No. Do, you, do you find that uh, they tolerate, like what I've seen, again, anecdotally with people on low-carb, ketogenic, even carnivorous diets, undergoing uh, chemotherapy, radiation therapies, they have less, they seem to have less side effects. They seem to tolerate their, their oncologists remark how well they tolerated the therapy mm -hmm. relative to other people. Is that something that you see in your trials as well? Um, we did not specially test that, but uh, I have anecdotal evidence uh, that confirms what you just said. It's, it's my personal experience as well with, um, with some patients. But these are only cases. Uh, we did not evaluate this systematically. Yeah. Most, you know, it, it's great to have, you know, looking at therapeutics for cancer. Most of us would prefer to avoid it in the first place. Is there any data that would suggest, because you mentioned, you know, IGF, uh, insulin, uh, glucose, all contributing to cancer growth. Is there any evidence that diet can prevent the formation of, of, of cancer? Is there, is there some sort of good data on that? Well, if you concern epidemiological data, good data, I'm not, I, I generally uh, would disagree with that statement, but we have a lot of epidemiological data that suggests that uh, eating a lower carbohydrate diet or eating a more paleolithic-like diet uh, is protective against cancer uh, growth or cancer initiation in general, uh, especially if you think about the metabolic syndrome. I mean, there's good evidence that diabetes and metabolic syndrome um, is causally uh, related to cancer initiation and growth. And uh, we also know for sure that carbohydrates are a main driver of uh, diabetes um, development. So it's a logical step to, to go from carb restriction to prevention of cancer. Yeah, when we, when we look at, because I, I keep trying to explain to people, you know, these risk factors and, and, you know, people are saying, well, if you eat red meat, you're going to get colon cancer. I said, well, there are far more important risks for colon cancer than how much you may or may not eat. And, you know, if you look at obesity, visceral fat, diabetes, chronic inflammation, particularly when it comes to GI disease, having these GI uh, problems like uh, inflammatory bowel disease uh, tend to be much bigger risk factors, even orders of magnitude bigger than that. Do you find that, uh, um, and, and again, I, I I know you're a fan of exercise as a triathlete, and I'm sure you still take care. What about exercise? Does it have an impact on our cancer risk? I mean, it seems obvious, but do we know conclusively that, it's, that it mitigates that? Yes, exercise has a huge impact on cancer risk. Mm -hmm. uh, this is also very clear from, from the data that are out there. It also has an impact if you already have cancer on long-term prognosis, uh, it improves the tolerability of, of the treatment. Um, it has basically exercise lowers inflammation in the body because if the muscle is um, stimulated by exercise, um, it will secrete, which is called uh, myokines. It's like uh, anti-inflammatory hormones secreted by muscle tissue, but only if, it's get, if it gets stimulated with a high enough stimulus. Um, then there are all these metabolic um, effects of exercise, like lowering blood sugar, lowering insulin, reducing body fat. Um, so a lot of benefits that you can gain from exercise. And I would al always recommend um, combining exercise and dietary treatment. 
By the way, I would also recommend for every cancer patient uh, stress reduction because stress is also a very uh, potent stimulus uh, of um, yeah metabolic derangements. Stress uh, poses a lot of um, yeah it elevates uh, catecholamine uh, levels like cortisol, which uh, again raises blood sugar levels, which again uh, is the preferred food for cancer cells. Um, Exercise also has a, um, a detrimental impact on the mitochondria. Uh, not uh, stress, I mean chronic stress, a detrimental impact on mitochondria. Um, so if we think about the importance of mitochondria in uh, keeping a cell healthy, then it's always a good idea to reduce stress. And from my personal experience, I must say that uh, basically every cancer patient is stressed. Uh, only. Um, the the diagnosis of being diagnosed with cancer alone is sufficient to to uh, trigger certain uh, stress responses, uh, anxiety, and uh, I think uh, basically patients would need uh, some kind of complementary uh, therapy for uh, reducing anxiety and chronic stress. But uh, unfortunately, the, this is time intensive and um, it's not well paid. By the healthcare system, so it, it basically plays no role. This is unfortunate. In Germany, what is the reception to a ketogenic diet there in the medical community and the, the community at large? In the U.S., you know, there's, there's obviously big proponents, and there's a lot of pushback from the sort of the, I guess, mm -hmm. the status status quo folks. They think it's it's uh, mm -hmm. it's some awful, unsustainable, you know, risky diet, and uh, we see that push pretty hard. What's it like in Germany? I think it's similar. Um, there are also, you, you have a lot of proponents and the community is growing, um, but you also still have resistance in the uh, higher ranked um, official yeah, societies. For example, the German Nutrition Society still is similar to the US uh, by recommending 50% uh, carbohydrates in the diet. Uh, also for cancer patients, a lot of grains, whole grains, uh, because they are supposed to be healthy um, and uh, not too much fat, especially not too much uh, animal fats and animal proteins. So it's this, I would say it's the same here as in the US and basically it's the same because there are similar industry interests involved. That's my personal opinion, but yeah, your 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 opinion is shared by me. I think industry <laughs> dictates policy more than than uh, science does, quite honestly. But yeah. um, let me ask you because uh, this is another thing, and maybe you have more insight into this. Thomas Safer is always talking about, uh, in addition to glucose, uh, glutamine being a, a fuel for cancers. Is that something that you see in your research? Have you looked into that as far as a metabolism um, for cancer? We haven't looked at, at that specifically because it's hard to uh, to look at it. Uh, for example, there's no there's not there is uh, a glu uh, glutamine trace of in in uh, positron emission tomography, but only very specialized clinics uh, can do it, and patients. I, I don't think the insurance will pay for it, uh, so it's not uh, a routine examination to look at glutamine, for example. Um, also, I think that glutamine, it, might, it plays certainly an important role in, in some tumor types, but it's not as ubiquitous as um, or ge as general as uh, glucose fermentation is in cancer cells. Um, and it's, it's also quite much harder to, to target than glucose because glut you can't avoid eating glutamine and uh, you also cannot avoid uh, the body um, producing glutamine. By itself, because glutamine is a very important amino acid. But you can't also prevent your body from producing glucose, you know, either. So that's it's right. Where you're going to have glucose made for garbage. Yes, that's right. Um, but uh, you, uh, what you can do is uh, limit uh, the amount of insulin being secreted by not that, uh, ingesting too much glucose and. You can also uh, limit glu the blood glucose level to a lower threshold, I would say, uh, which then will uh, lead together with uh, low insulin levels to an increase of ketone bodies. And ketone bodies by themselves, they may be therapeutic. 
against cancer cells. And there is a lot of uh, extra benefits. Do we and, have uh, a, can you, I mean, is there, a, and there may not be no way to answer this question, but is there a way to say which has a stronger effect, higher insulin levels or higher glucose levels when it comes to tumor growth? Uh, that's a good question. Um, it's hard, hard to answer. I think that um, maybe even in vitro studies, are there any ones where they X amount of glucose versus X amount of insulin? And we should really, <laughs> that, that might be just a way to quantify. I'm it. not aware of any study that uh, tested this uh, glucose versus insulin um, because usually uh, in the body, you can separate both effects. So it's hard to, to say which will impact uh, tumor growth more. Because every time there's high glucose, there's also high high insulin. Um, yeah, I think it depends. Also, there not every tumor cell has um, has an overexpression of insulin receptors. I mean, gen in general, the more aggressive a tumor cell is, the more insulin receptors it will have on its cell surface, and the more uh, responsive it will be to glucose. Because uh, the more uh, damaged mitochondria it has, and uh, so it, it will rely more on glucose fermentation. You mentioned, you know, and you mentioned Warburg, you know, and his his work from the 1920s or 30s, I can't remember when he, I know it was 100 years ago, but with the PET scans, do, do you see, uh, you know, high uptake and, and, and then put somebody on a ketogenic diet and see the uptake is lower? Have, have you looked at that? Have you been able to demonstrate that in either animals or humans? Uh, we did not look at that, but there are studies out there that did exactly this. And you you see a reduction in glucose uptake in tumor tissue, but also in, in normal tissue like, uh, for example, the heart. Okay. Yeah. There, are even, there are even studies now attempting to, um, to reduce the amount of uh, this glucose tracer taken up by the heart by um, pre-treating the patient with a ketogenic diet for a few days just to reduce the background noise by the heart, the background signal. What is, so, uh, where are, is, there diff is, it, is it difficult to secure funding for these studies? Are these studies considered hard to get through IRB to put somebody on a, on a ketogenic diet when they have cancer? Is that something that you get a lot of pushback from? Uh, we simply started, uh, we funded the study by our own. So we did not recruit any industry funds. What we did was uh, recruit some industry products in the beginning because we thought it would uh, ease the implementation of the ketogenic diet if we uh, give the patients, for example, MCT oil, so medium chain, chain triglycerides. Um, we also used an amino acid supplement which contains eight essential amino acids in a special blend um, so that the... Um, they won't be catabolized by the body, but only be uh, taken for anabolic purposes, at least in theory. I'm not sure if that really works uh, in the body, but that's uh, the theory behind it. So we obtained some, some samples from uh, some companies, but um, I am personally, I'm more a fan of a very natural diet containing only natural foods, and uh, you won't find any sponsor for that. So basically, the patients bought their food by their own. I mean, they were really motivated to, to try the diet. And uh, we had some very good experiences with most patients. I mean, as I said, um, not every patient is suited for a ketogenic diet, but uh, it benefits many patients psychologically or emotionally or um, by the, from their body composition. And then if they... If they um, recognize the, the benefits, they will stick to the diet, especially if the diet is, um, is seen as a complementary treatment to the uh, standard of care treatments. This helps uh, the patients motivate themselves to maintain the diet for five or six weeks, but their normal radiation therapy less. Yeah, do you... Um, uh... You mentioned not eating enough. I know some people will, will argue that fasting has a unique role and that calorie restriction is beneficial for some of the same reasons you pointed out, low glucose, low inflammation. How does, 
how does it, you know, a cancer patient who is, is potentially going to be suffering from cachexia, they, they, they have this potential for loss of muscle and lean tissue. How do you balance that? Is there any, any thought on that? Um, so our experience in, in cachectic or let's say in, in very frail patients, like patients with head and neck cancer, um, our experience is that in this case, the ketogenic diet uh, benefits the body composition. These patients will gain um, or they maintain their skeletal muscle mass to a much greater extent than if they eat normally. I mean, the side effects of radiation treatment are really severe in these patients and also especially when combined with chemotherapy. So they suffer from um, swallowing problems, for example, um, from um, yeah, saliva, um, uh, how to say, um, you know what I mean? If, um, yeah, if the saliva dries out, so they, they really have problems eating, especially in the last weeks of radiotherapy or radiochemotherapy. And our experience was that the greatest impact that um, on, on, on body composition was chemotherapy. It, it, it's the greatest predictor of uh, body mass loss and skeletal muscle mass loss. But the ketogenic diet had exactly opposite effects. It protected skeletal muscle and it protected um, body weight. Um, however, not as strongly as the chemotherapy effect. So it was not able to fully um, prevent weight loss in these patients, but it, it counteracted weight loss. And uh, the opposite is observed, uh, for example, in breast cancer and rectal cancer patients. Um, they, in this case, the patients, um, in most cases, they have too much body weight, they have too much uh, adipose tissue. And in, this in these cases, the ketogenic diet will lead to a reduction of uh, body weight and a reduction of fat mass while maintaining uh, muscle mass, which is a very good thing for these patients. So women, breast cancer uh, patients, they were happy by, by losing body fat from week to week and uh, maintaining their skeletal muscle. So that, that eased uh, the, com the uh, compliance to the diet a lot. How much of an impact would you say uh, obesity has on the, the, the genesis of cancer? Is it, is it, a, is it a moderate, large effect? Can you, do we have any sort of comparators to say, you know, lean mass mm -hmm. versus uh, obesity? I think it's a large effect. It's, uh, I don't have exact numbers, but I would say it, it um, doubles, at, le at least doubles the risk of getting certain cancers, uh, especially breast cancer, prostate cancer in men, uh, which account for the majority of all cancers. Um, so to my knowledge, most cancer types are associated with obesity. Not every cancer, of course, but at least the the major um, cancers that afflict our Western civilization, like breast, rectal cancer, um, prostate cancer, um, pancreatic cancer, uh, so, so, uh, gynecological cancers. So obesity has certainly a, a large impact. Yeah, I've, I've seen that I think with, with breast cancer, something like one in three women are affected, at least in the U.S. And then with men, I think mm -hmm. prostate's even more than that. It's like one in two, you know, depending if you live long less. Now, most men will die with, with, with prostate cancer and not of prostate cancer, but it's very right. common. We see that over and yeah. over again. And I think some of that, do you feel that a lot of that is, is due to insulin exposure? Do you think that has a, has a role to play? Yes. It's insulin exposure. Um, in addition, there are hormone-sensitive cancers like breast and prostate, which are negative, so their growth is affected by a hormonal disbalance associated with, um, with obesity. Um, and of course, you have the adipoqueens, which are pro-inflammatory hormones secreted by adipose tissue in addition to insulin which stimulates tumor growth. As I said in the beginning, it's like inf inflammation always stimulates tumor growth. Yeah. So again, I, I cannot say exactly what effect insulin has compared to adipokines or um, yeah, elevated glucose levels or uh, hormonal disbalance. But basically all these factors um, contribute together and, and act basically synergistically in stimulating tumor growth.
Yeah. So I, you know, you think about, you know, if, if, I, if I'm a drug company, I want a drug that prevents the adipokines, prevents the insulin, prevents the glucose, where yeah. whereas I can just lose weight and do exercise and eat well and, and take care of all of those things. Right. Uh, that would be, but you know, you can't put that in a pill very easily. Um, right. Do you, you know, as far as, uh, you know, do we have it like, is, are there any thoughts on how much obesity is, you know, is, is it 10 kilos too much? Is it 50 kilos? Where do we say, is it, I assume it's just a direct linear relationship. The more obese you are, the higher your risk goes. Is that, or is there a threshold level that we know? No, I, I think there's a dose response, not uh, without a threshold. But right. I cannot say if it's a linear increase in risk or uh, some other functional form. I cannot say that, but the the less obese you are, the better. Yeah, and we have we keep getting the messaging that big is beautiful, and we we have this sort of uh, healthy at any size sort of thing, which I think is unfortunate that people are being kind of convinced that that is that is somehow uh, good for them or, or not. I mean, Yes, there are also differences, of course, in uh, how how adipose tissue is distributed in the body. So we, we know that subcutaneous uh, fat is not as inflammatory as uh, visceral fat, for example. Yeah, we see, we see that difference in men and women. You know, men tend to have most of their, their fat in the abdominal area, and then they get a lot of visceral fat, whereas some of the women... Uh, store it uh, subcutaneously, particularly in the hips and thighs, uh, kind of yeah. distribution pattern, which, which pretends a different risk, I believe. Um, do you, um, let's see, with regard to radiation oncology, do you find that uh, how accepting are is a radiation oncology or the, 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 the uh, community in general about? diet or do they even have any concern about that do you do you find that they don't even, they just disregard diet completely or do they actually think about this uh, my experience is that radiation colleges are quite open compared to other physicians maybe it has to do with uh, bec by becoming a radiation oncologist you have to have some uh, leaning towards um, yeah physics and the natural sciences because it's uh, or tech techniques, technology. So you're more open-minded than maybe other disciplines. Uh, so most radiation oncologists also know that diet is, diet is an important part of treatment, especially for frail uh, patient populations like head and neck cancer. Um, so they, the acceptance of dietary treatments is high, I would say. Yeah. But of course, uh, not every radiation oncologist is convinced that a ketogenic diet is right. Uh, it, it it might boil down to personal experiences with a diet, uh, to the the, doc, uh, the the knowledge that a doctor has by himself or herself. Um, most most physicians physicians are still not aware of um, great details concerning diet and how it affects metabolism and especially tumor cell metabolism. Yeah, they they don't learn that in their um, employment or in their studies. So they have to be interested by themselves and yeah, study and research these topics. You had mentioned that exercise has a pretty big effect on um, mitigation of, of disease or, or prevention of mm -hmm. cancer and other diseases. Does the type of exercise make a difference? Is it, should we all just be jogging? Should we be doing some strength training? How do you feel about the different types of training? Um, first of all, I would recommend doing the type of exercise that the patient is most um, easily motivated to do, because it's important that he or she does anything first. That's the first priority. Um, if there is great motivation to try something out or to engage in exercise, I would always recommend uh, lifting heavy weights, because that uh, has a very high stimulus for um, building muscle mass, which is again, anti-inflammatory. And uh, in, in, yeah, in addition, maybe a little bit of endurance training, but not too intensive. Because um, if you do in too, in too, too intensive training, uh, especially endurance type training, 
um, the amount of uh, catecholamines uh, or cortisol will increase. So it's like a type of chronic stress to the body. They, they shouldn't overdo it, especially if they are under co um, contemporary uh, treatment. And, and this is coming from a triathlete, someone who's, who's engaged in triathlon. So is that, <laughs> how, do you, how do you reconcile that? You mean uh, the combination of, of ketogenic diet and, and triathlon? Well, you, you just mentioned that too much endurance training is going to be ah, a net okay. problem that you're a triathlete. Yeah, we, were we were talking about cancer patients under therapy. Okay. That was my thought. For a healthy for a healthy person, uh, it's great to to go to the extreme <laughs> from time to time to test the body. I mean, it's a great thing to learn about ourselves and and the abilities that our body has. But if you're already sick and you are undergoing a, a, a treatment which is very demanding physically, also, then I would not advise um, doing too strenuous exercise or too intensive concurrently okay. okay and then uh from a i guess from an athlete standpoint how do you are you I, i'm assuming you you eat a relatively lower carbohydrate diet is that fair to say yes that's that's fair to say i do a ketogenic diet from time to time i also do like uh, some carnivore days from time to time um, and basically, I eat compared to most other athletes. I eat a, a low carb diet. And, so, and how does it does that impact you negatively in any way, or do you find it no problems with that? Um, my experience is uh, with the carnivore diet, it had a negative impact, and I'm not sure why that why that is the case. Maybe um, it was some type of um, getting used to it problem. So I did it for ten days, I think, yeah, ten days while training normally and i was running i was hitting the wall yeah after 10 days like some some kind of uh, light overtraining symptoms um, yeah, yeah yeah 10 days would be would be insufficient to adapt in my in my experience but that's yeah, yeah. If, if, but, if there's no reason yeah. there's no reason maybe i i have to take more time for adaption and in this time i lower my uh, exercise intensity but um Besides that, I, I, I like to eat um, fruit from time to time. So um, I see no need for me to, to do a fully carnivore diet. I mean, I eat, I eat a lot of meat, I must say. Um, maybe sometimes, yeah, like, um, how's, um, yeah, I, I, my, I emphasize animal products largely. Um, and I also have problems when I eat too many vegetables. So um, this uh, results naturally in a low carbish diet. Well, and I, I see in Germany, I think there aren't they starting to recommend that people stop eating meat? Is that something we're seeing by the German health authorities? Is that become? Uh, yes, the trend is also the same here. It's like uh, vegan being the best diet for the planet and, and veganism being... Uh, the savior for every problem we have, and yeah, especially young young um, adults are, are very prone to eating a vegan diet or vegetarian diet because they think it's it's better for the planet and for their health. But um, yeah, I don't <laughs> I don't share these uh, thoughts because I think um, there are other ways to to protect the planet, better ways. Like raising uh, animals in a in a good way, for example. Yeah, yeah I, I don't disagree with you there. I, I saw you know there's been a recent increase in younger people with specifically with colorectal cancer, and there was a there was an article I think it was in one of the one of the uh, papers from the UK, and they had I think 20 people, and I think probably close to half of them were vegetarian or vegan, and they were developing. Okay colorectal cancer, which I thought was an interesting trend mm. uh, that we see that. Do you, um, as far as somebody who is, you know, I guess, looking to avoid cancer, most of us, you know, I mean, we're all going to die of something at some point. I think most of us would prefer it not be cancer. Um, what, what, is there some basic things you would recommend? I mean, I don't know if we have, I guess, based on what the knowledge is out there, how to, how to avoid cancer if we can. <laughs> Uh, first of all, I would recommend uh, reduce chronic stress. 
and enjoy the enjoy life without anxiety, especially in these times. Yeah, if we think about the COVID uh, um, crisis, uh, I I stopped. Uh, for example, I stopped reading newspapers already many years ago, and it was one of the best choices I made. I I don't own a TV. Um, I decide by myself if I want to see a movie or anything like that. Then I can select it by myself. I don't need the program to program me. Yeah. Um, so this would be my first um, tip uh, or advice. Then, of course, um, try to eat a natural diet. Uh, basically, as humans have eaten uh, for 100,000 Hundred thousands of years. Uh, that means a paleo-like diet that doesn't have to be, uh, ex um, yeah, very strict uh, avoidance of certain foods if you can tolerate them. For example, me, um, I do what you can call cheat day from time to time, uh, also for social reasons. Uh, then, uh, and it doesn't uh, hurt me in any way. So. Um, I can tolerate small amounts of grains also, so I, I consume them from time to time. Yeah. Um, um, I think if you are too strict with yourself, um, this in the long run, uh, you will maybe lose motivation to eat healthy or uh, you will um, build too much stress by yourself. Um, and then, of course, exercise. Do engage in exercise uh, in any type that you like. Um, this would be another advice. Uh, doesn't In the first place, it doesn't matter whether it's endurance or, or um, strength, strength or anything in between. Um, the most important thing is that you move your body. And of course, socializing is very important. That also has to do with stress reduction and um, yeah, living a happy life. Let me ask you about um, because I, I, you know, I've been so focused on nutrition and lifestyle, but sometimes it's interesting to hear what's going on in the sort of conventional medical world. I mean, radiation oncology. I mean, radiation has been used in cancer therapy for many, many decades now. Has there been an evolution? Is there something? There's some new technology, or is this, you know? I mean, I, the critics would be, you know, Thomas Seifert would say, you know, you're slashing and burning everything. You know, it's radiation and, and, and poisoning things. Is there any sort of evolution in, in that is there sort of more precision oh, yes. in the, how has that been going yeah yeah there there has been a great technical uh, revolution so uh, it was mainly driven by new technical innovations um so radiation you cannot compare radiation treatment uh, nowadays with uh, maybe 20 years ago or even 10 years ago it has changed a lot and we are now much better able to spare normal tissue than we, than we were 20 years ago. Uh, we can focus um, radiation, uh, the radiation much more precisely on the tumor without damaging the surrounding normal tissue. Um, there are techniques, for example, stereotactic uh, body radiotherapy where you can treat tumors as small as five millimeters with a high, very high dose and very high precision, uh, some sometimes even in a single fraction of uh, radiotherapy, which is then called radio surgery, because it's basically like cutting the tumor out by applying a very large dose in one single fraction. And um, yes, I, I would say that it's been a, a great evolution. And this is uh, different from chemotherapy, for example. Um, basically, we still give the same chemotherapeutics that we gave 20 or 30 years ago. So, um, yeah, if I personally would suffer from cancer, uh, I think I would not. And this is now my personal opinion, but I think I would decline doing the chemotherapy because of the collateral damage that it does to the body. Um, uh, I would accept radiotherapy because it's a local treatment. And of course, if it's able to cut the tumor out, Patients should cut the tumor out in the first place. And then, of course, he, he or she needs the complementary treatments. You mentioned, and I didn't touch on this, but you'd mentioned hyperbaric oxygen being a, you know, basically a enhancement. How did, is that 
actually work or do we have any data on that? How does it work? Um, hyperbaric oxygen uh, works by um, supplying much more oxygen to the tissues on, and the cells. Um, and uh, what happens in tumor cells, because as I said, they, and as Thomas Seyfried um, uh, proposes, uh, and he is right in, in, in that uh, tumor cells produce a lot of react reactive oxygen species by their mitochondrial metabolism. So if you enhance oxygen levels in the tumor cell, um, the amount of reactive oxygen species will also uh, grow to a large extent. And to deal with all these reactive oxygen species, tumor cells have to have to um, upregulate their glycolytic pathway even more for producing their own antioxidants. For example, glut glutathione or lactate is also an important antioxidant, but they can all only do this to a certain extent. And for example, if you combine hyperbaric oxygen treatment um, in direct proximity with, radi with radiotherapy, radiotherapy is also a very potent user of reactive oxygen species. So if you uh, increase these reactive oxygen uh, radicals um, just before you irradiate, then uh, you will destroy much more tumor cells than without the hyperbaric oxygen treatment. However, this is a logistical problem and also hyperbaric oxygen chambers um, are very expensive. Um, we, in our clinic, we, we have a, a hyperbaric oxygen chamber which only fits one person. It's, it's a milled hyperbaric oxygen chamber, which um, has uh, 1.3 atmospheres. So it's like diving in three meters uh, depth underwater. Uh, this is already sufficient to enhance oxygen levels uh, in, in all tissues to a very high degree. But most uh, therapeutic hyperbaric oxygen chambers that are used also in my knowledge in, in cancer, therapy, they have 2.5 bars or 2.5. Uh, it's like uh, 15 meters diving. So, um, but these are much more expensive and it's also logistically uh, difficult to treat a patient with hyperbaric oxygen and then immediately um, move him or her to the radiation uh, treating facility. So, but in principle, it's a very good... Um, yeah, complementary th uh, treatment. Yeah, there's a question one of our one of our listeners uh, uh, yep. is asking about EWOT exercise with oxygen. Um, I don't know if you have any experience with that. If that, if that, you know, obviously, if you're, I guess you're ex extra ex exercising with oxygen, increased oxygen flow, is that something that is ever considered to use, or does it have a similar effect? Exercising with ox with oxygen, like in an oxygen chamber, or well, I guess you're either breathing breathing oxygen, or you might be in an oxygen chamber. I'm not sure how it how it's exactly done, but uh, uh, again, you'd have to get somebody who's sick with cancer to exercise. <laughs> they maybe they may not be in the mood to do that, but it, it could be something. Maybe you could have them cycle at a, at a low pace or something like that. I so, don't know. I'm not aware of okay. any research on that. I mean, uh, I'm familiar with with basically the opposite like altitude training yeah so he's, he's talking like the about, opposite he's talking about on a bike with 84 percent oxygen and so that's like four times the normal oxygen level so okay uh, that, again don't know that you don't have any experience with that um one last i was one oh yeah well, what do you have are you working on any new papers now is there anything you said you get to do whatever you want are you do you have something coming up right now <laughs> Uh, yes, um, what I have. <laughs> so I, I was uh, quite active now in um, writing about the Corona crisis. So wh whoever is interested can uh, can get the papers from my homepage, for example. Um, so I'm, I'm very critical about what happened politically and uh, because in my opinion, uh, what everyone neglected was our own immune system, which is quite potent in fighting viruses or infectious diseases. Um, so I wrote about that and still have some uh, modeling studies in preparation. Um, yeah, they have, to do, they have to do with the uh, impact of the vaccines on mortality or not. So this is one uh, issue. Then we 
still have to, um, there's a paper coming out soon about the head and neck cancer cohort from our study that I mentioned. So this had not uh, yet been published. We published the breast cancer cohort and the rectal cancer cohort already. And now uh, it's time for the head and neck cancer cohort. Um, what I want to do uh, is um, a study with a carnivore diet. And um, yeah, chances mm -hmm. are that we get something uh, started in our clinic in the near future by maybe having 10 patients on a carnivore diet and compare them with 10 patients on a vegan diet, for example. I, I think these two extremes would be very interesting uh, in, interesting to compare. So this is one of my dreams that I still have um, to do clinically. Um, yeah. That would be great. I think that, that would be wonderful. Well, I unfortunately have to go, Renner. It's been, a, it's been an absolute pleasure chatting with you. Where do people go to find out more about, about your, your stuff? Do you have some social media or website or anything where people can find out more information? Oh, um, I, um, I got rid of my Facebook account <laughs> because it, <laughs> it really depressed me. <laughs> so um, basically, people can visit my homepage. I'm not quite active in social media, but um, people can go to my homepage. They will, they will find some information about me personally and my research. It's uh, simply www.brianaclement.com or .de for Deutschland. Um, yes. Okay. That's Perfect. Well, thank you. you. You and I share a lot of similar similar thoughts on things. Anyway, a pr pleasure and have a great evening. Thank you so much for doing this. We look forward to, to more information out of it. And good luck getting that study. And we're, like you, we're going to try to do some stuff. Well, we are going to be doing some studies on carnivore diets and different different uh, diseases and whatnot. That's great. So interesting. So Great to um, hear, yes. Good, good to yeah, see you. Yeah, it was an honor for me. Thank you very much for the invitation. Awesome. Thank you very much for being here. Guys, I got to go. We'll see you guys tomorrow. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.